Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Swirl Lewis Johnson here. <clears throat> Just wanted to check in with you uh, real quick <clears throat> and uh, provide you an update on myself um, as I move towards my last round of chemotherapy next week, starting on Monday and ending on Wednesday. And I uh, also want to give you an update on my friend Ralph as I visited him, him and his wife yesterday in the hospital and cover some bedside manners for those uh, loved ones that are going through the dying process. Just cover some tips there. Uh, first things first, um, you know, I'm, I'm still remaining positive, staying strong, making it through, made it through my uh, 11th round of chemo. Um, as I move towards my 12th round of chemo, I'm experiencing uh, uh, neuropathy in my fingers. Um, that's where you feel the tingling sensation in your hands and in your body and different things like that while I'm feeling it in my fingers, specifically in my fingertips to feel kind of numb where I'm really losing the feeling for certain things. And which also affects my ability to, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat's kind of dry. <clears throat> excuse me, which is also an effect from chemotherapy. Uh, anyways, it affects my ability to button up my shirt and different things like that because I'm losing the strength in my, my fingertips. But I still got strength in my hands and uh, having strong hands and, 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 and losing the feeling in my fingertips. It's been kind of awkward for me. Been dropping things, maybe breaking a few things by accident because it's kind of it causes a, a feeling of clumsiness in you. <clears throat> Not that I was already clumsy to before this, and it just makes it worse for those who know me. Um, so yeah, that's that. And I'm also feeling the numbness, uh, tingling in my, in my toes as well. So that's about it. I still say that um, it could be a lot worse. I know it could be a lot worse. And there are other individuals out there who are a lot worse off than I am. And I'm thankful for that. Um, of course, the normal effects of chemo, which I'm not going to go through all of them, which is the nausea and other side effects of chemo and different things like that, uh, that I'm experiencing. And, and that's the thing. Um, there are certain things during this chemotherapy treatment that you just learn to accept and, and as normal, unfortunately. And uh, you just don't go crying to the doctor every time because it's just uh, something that you should expect. And and realize that that's going to happen when you start doing chemotherapy. <clears throat> Such is the case with me. There are some certain things and different things that I'm experiencing. Again, I'm not going to go through it, but it is what it is. So enough about me. Um, next thing on the list, I want to cover bedside manners for um, those loved ones who are going through the dying process. And uh, I ran across this um, yesterday. It was in a break room when I went to go visit Ralph and his wife. Um, and this is covered by Robert Tycross. Robert Tycross came up with eight things that you should say to your loved ones. And, and just a little bit about Robert Tycross. And I just learned about him uh, yesterday. Um, he's a retired British physician who pushed for the hospice movement. He pushed for the palliative care a movement in the 70s and made it uh, uh, become known as an acceptable practice in, in, in the world of medicine. So wherever you are, Robert Tycross, God bless you. Uh, very important. So here's that list. Eight things that you should uh, uh, um, uh, tell someone uh, before they die. Thank you. I love two. I love you. Three. I'll miss you. Four. I forgive you. Six. We are okay. Uh, seven. We'll see each other again. And eight, of course, goodbye. Now, think about that. That is so powerful. If we all just did that while we're still living, and not waiting until the dying process and when someone's laying on their deathbed to say this. Think about, think about how much better this world 
would actually be. And this is a this is not just for hospice, but this is just for everyday living, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is something that we all should strive for. So wherever you are, write write it down. This is something that is really cool, and um, we all do it sometimes in some sort of way. Um, but these are eight definite things that Robert Ty Cross recommended that you should cover with your individuals, uh, loved ones before they die. And not only, ladies and gentlemen, is it, is it a healing process for the individual going through the dying process, but it's a healing process for uh, the other person, the people who are still living here and going to be left behind on this earth. It's a healing process for both. I don't know how many people that are today suffering because they never had a chance to say this. And I'm telling you, this is real. Um, so that's pretty much the top um, um, bedside manners that you definitely want to definitely clear the air with, with, with someone that's going through the dying process to help them and to help yourself. Um, my mom, bless her heart, uh, passed away in 2005. And, uh, you know, received the call on my birthday. Um, the doctor had called, actually called my wife and uh, said that, hey, sorry, we're not going to release Mrs. Johnson until someone can pick her up from the hospital. And of course, I lived in Colorado at the time and she was in Ohio uh, in a hospital in West Virginia. And uh, so uh, my wife, Flew down there immediately. Uh, that day we got her a ticket. They flew down there to take care of her. Um, left on my birthday. That was September. And my mom passed away the end of October. So I moved. I went down there too. And we lived down there for like 60 days. And my mom never made it out of the hospital. She ended up passing away of pancreatic cancer. But while she was alive, man, I was just so focused on taking care of everything for her. Uh, I found some bills that were not um, paid up. Her life insurance had uh, um, went unpaid and had lapsed. She had like a, a week before it got paid, before they just totally just um, got rid of it. And um, plus other things and, and stuff like that. And so um, I was focused on taking care of those bills for her, got her life insurance taken care of. And she was in a hospital. And I thank God that I was able to uh, spend time with her in her last days because um, this one e particular e evening before she went to a, to a coma, um, I was so focused. I was so tired and sick as we were pulling shifts. Um, wanted to go home and back to home and uh, eat a pizza. I was starving. And she said, wait a minute, Sorrel. Where are you going? Why are you in a hurry? Stay with me a little bit longer. You know, uh, meal's about to come. Let's share a meal together. And that just opened up my eyes to, wow, you know, when you're in your last days, it's not your bank account that you're worried about. It's not any other things that you're worried about. You're worried about the time. Time matters time the quality time that you get to spend with those that you love and appreciate in your life the most and my mom wanted to spend time with me at that time and just her subtle request of me wanting just to stay a little bit longer made all the world difference to her and uh, we shared our last meal together and um, right after that she went into a coma and um yeah, the following month, she ended up passing away. But before she went into a coma, <clears throat> she woke back up out of nowhere. She was completely, uh, had no eyesight. Um, in a coma, on oxygen, ripped the oxygen mask off her face and delivered a powerful message that is just, 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 just warms my heart to this day. I'll never forget it. Me and other people were in a room during that time that got the witness that unfortunately those, some of those people are not alive, but uh, um, I thank God I'm able to cover it in my book. It will be in my book, which will be published uh, <clears throat> um, next year. 
So look forward to coming out with that, but uh, some amazing, amazing things. So, um, yeah, as far as his eight things that Robert Tycross covers in his hospice with individuals, fortunately I was able to go through that with my mother, not at all one time. And that's the thing, you don't want to go through this and cover it all at one time with individuals. It's so much to, to carry. It's so much to talk about. It's so heavy. Yeah, but slowly you want to go through the process of these eight things that you should talk about before that person passes away. Me and my mom did that over a year's time frame before we even knew that she had, was going to pass away, um, fortunately, and I'm thankful for that. It was a healing process for me, and it was a healing process definitely for her. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that I was able to reassure her before she passed away was, hey, mom, everything is all good. You know, bills are all paid up. Um, don't have to worry about anything. And um, she let out one of the biggest sighs of relief and just was in complete peace during that time. And I'm just so thankful for that. Um, the other thing is uh, um, uh, my wife, uh, lost my wife unexpectedly um, over seven years, a little bit over seven years ago. But fortunately, we lived by these eight things. We always lived by these things. Um, the only thing that we weren't able to, to do was to say goodbye because it was so unexpected. But uh, she wrote me a um, love letter and reminded me that she loved me a couple weeks before she passed away. Neither one of us knew what was going to happen. And um, it was one of the most beautiful love letters she ever wrote me. And, and uh, remind me about that movie that we watched together, The Notebook, and how she wanted to live her life like that and go out of this world like that. Um, so it was a healing process for me. Um, healing process for her. Um, like again, other than the, the eighth thing, goodbye. Wasn't able to do that. Ralph. Let's talk about my friend Ralph. Uh, Ralph, him and his wife are going through this right now. Um, I have gone through it and, and um, again this is where I got this list from from a break room in their hospital and um, which has been a healing process for Ralph and it's been a healing process for his wife as well and um, Ralph man continues to inspire me even in his last days um, continues to inspire me so last week I went to uh, visit him. He was able to sit up. He had all the strength that he could to sit up. Um, was able to to speak, not loudly, but able to speak and everything. And he was fully aware. Um, still have jaundice. This uh, yesterday, I went to go visit him, and um, he's incapacitated. Um, all he wants to do is sleep, and uh, his food supply has been cut off. He's not eating and uh, unable to go to the bathroom by himself and uh, uh, is confined to his bed. Um, yesterday, uh, him and his, me, him and his, him and his wife, or his wife and I, we played his favorite song, which is um, Cat Stevens, Moon Shadow. And uh, he woke up and sat up and um, I reminded him that, that I loved him, told him I was his real friend and will always be there till the end by his side. And he let out one of the biggest smiles um, that I've ever seen, which is one of the things that um, I told him about, we talked about while he was living. I told him that, yay, man. And I didn't know his condition. I told him, hey, you inspire me, man. We both come here to these chemo treatments and everyone is talking all this negative talk and different things like that. But you, I said, I look over across the room, you're silent, but you're smiling, man. And I just want you to know you inspired me. And in that same breath, he told me, you know what? I've been meaning to tell you that you inspire me too. And that's how me and Ralph began a relationship about a month and a half, two months ago. And uh, little did I know about his condition would be worse. Uh, his wife didn't know, he didn't know. Um, 
the way it was supposed to go. He was supposed to go through his chemotherapy treatments to shrink the tumor that's in his esophagus, which is now blocking his bile ducts. Um, it was supposed to shrink it. And um, after his last chemo, they were going to do a check. And then they were going to have surgery to remove the tumor. Well, um, unfortunately, Ralph is not able to finish his last chemotherapy treatment. And uh, the tumor has gotten bigger. It's blocking his bowel ducts. And um, uh, to perform surgery on it like planned will only um, be life-threatening and be a risk and will puncture um, organs that are next to everything when they go inside of them. It's just too dangerous. And so uh, that's the state that Ralph is in. Um, shortly after Ralph, Ralph sat up, heard a song, um, saw that I was there and let all the big smile, he went back to sleep. Um, it's just a matter of time now before uh, it's the end for him, at least on this earth. But uh, it's just amazing how he continues to inspire me even in his last days. And that's what I want to share with you, ladies and gentlemen, is that, um, you know, <clears throat> it's not just the dying process, but in, in me watching these individuals go through their last days, man, and seeing them stay true to their character and their true self, authentic self, and smiling and recognizing that as long as they have breath and the consciousness, that their uh, blessing to someone has totally inspired me on how to live my life on a daily basis, let me tell you, and continues to inspire me to this day. People look at me and be like, hey, Sorrel, you know, how can you have so much, how can you be so positive energy in these times? And it's not about cancer. It's not about what's going bad with me, but all the good things that has happened in my life and all the good people that I've encountered along my journey that has inspired me. And let me tell you something, there's always a lesson for us to learn. And that's one of the lessons that I learned is how to live my life and watching others live theirs, even to their last dying day, last dying breath. And um, so just wanted to cover some bedside manners uh, with you, give you an update, um, continue to, to keep Ralph in his prayers and his family, his wife, if you would, if you're a prayer warrior out there, um, I'd much appreciate that. And another thing about bedside manners is, um, you know, um, quite a few weeks ago, I was in a room with Ralph at the time when he had the early stages of jaundice and was confined to the hospital. There was a preacher in there and uh, there's three other guys in there. At that time, it was me, Ralph, the preacher, and another guy next to the bed. And the preacher, was, I think it was a Catholic priest, whatever, based on his attire, and when he was dressed, uh, was sitting there with the other guy praying with them. You know, in silence, stuff. I like, couldn't hear him, but you could tell he was praying with him, had his eyes closed and different things like that. And didn't even have the decency to pray for my friend Ralph. Saw him in with yellow eyes, yellow skin and stuff like that. And had the nerve to um, ask me, hey, where's this guy from? What's his name? And turns to Ralph and looks at him and says, hey, you know what? You're really yellow. Now, you don't say that to someone that's dying. Ralph just smiled like, yeah, I know. And it took all my energy not to knock this preacher out, man. Um, took all my energy not to knock him out. But instead, after he left, you know what I did? And, and it's something that I've always done, and I did it yesterday. I prayed with Ralph. I held his hand, prayed with him. And I asked the guy next to me, next to him, next to Ralph, if I could pray for him too. And he gave me permission, he said, yeah, it's okay. Now, I wasn't asking him for permission, permission to pray, but I was asking for his permission to pray for him as well. So I included him in, in, in my prayers. And, and I just wanna let you know, if you're a Christian out there, if you're a believer, if you're a priest, well, whoever you are, if you believe in God and a higher power, and you're gonna be, you're gonna find yourself in a situation like that, don't leave anyone out. You know, I served in the military and we had this saying, you don't leave anyone behind. No man, no woman left behind. 
Well, you don't leave anyone behind in prayer, especially when you have the opportunity. It's, it's free. It's cost and lows. It costs nothing but time. And for all your naysayers out there who are saying, hey, man, you know, you don't know what religion someone is. It doesn't matter what religion they are. You ask them for their permission like I did. And if they don't give you permission, then you just pray for the individual that you that's before you. Yeah. But you don't stop being yourself for no one. Always stay true to your authentic self, no matter what. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to cover those bedside manners with you give you a quick update and um, yeah this is a, a challenging time for me I don't like to see my friend Ralph in his situation and his wife but um, it's tough it's part of the human ex human experience and what's that living and dying you know um, as cold as that sounds that's that, that's what it's about and it's about our individual journeys on the way. And I thank God that I'm able to accompany Ralph and his wife on his journey. Um, I'm thankful for his friendship to have met him and to have learned more about him and to continue to learn lessons from him and those around me and those that went before me. Um, learn lessons from them even in their last dying breath. And I'm just very thankful for that. Um, thankful for you all. Thank you for all you out there for following me on this journey. And um, God bless you, as always.